Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. If the people coming in can just do that a little bit quicker, then we can start with the session. I hope everybody enjoyed the lunch break and are going to the exhibitioners because I really need you to go there. And the events team just told me the session before us had 70 questions. So the lunch break, the break after this, we're going to cancel and see if we can go through all 70 questions we're going to get on this one. Jeremy, you don't need a break after this. No. Welcome, everybody. Welcome back after lunch. I need you to remember to provide feedback on the app you have on your phone or tablet. There's an area that you can buy, provide feedback on every session. And then remember the questions works as well on the app. You provide the questions, and then you can also rate questions to put it in a category for us to see if we can answer as many as can. OK, then I have the privilege of introducing our next speaker, Dr. Jeremy Lewis. Dr. Lewis works in both an academical and a clinical setting. He has academic appointments at three universities. He works as a clinician in NHC, as well as in private practice in central London. We mostly treat patients with complex shoulder problems. He's also a trained ultrasonographer who uses this skill to perform shoulder injections, if necessary and appropriate, in his rehabilitation program with patients. He has been awarded a fellowship of the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy. And he's been acknowledged as one of the five most eminent clinicians in his profession. Dr. Lewis has been challenging the way we treat shoulders for quite a few years. And I'm sure today is not going to be anything different. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Jeremy Lewis. Thank you very much. Um, so the, the title of the, uh, the talk I was asked to give is Expanding Our Ability to, to Manage Shoulder Pain. And my working title was the, uh, the conundrum that is the shoulder. And I've sort of kept that working title. The word conundrum comes from the Latin. Uh, I think it was first used in 1590. And um, it, the definition of it is something that, that puzzles or confuses. And I've spent a lot of my career around the shoulder, and I still get to the point where I'm saying it still puzzles and confuses me. I'd like to say an enormous thank you to the MACP and IFOMP. This has been an exceptional conference. I've enjoyed and learned so much, even in the last 24 hours. Uh, it's great, been a great honor, and thank you, thank you very much. So I'd like to start with some facts to impress your friends, maybe at a dinner party. Um, we can tell, you can tell your friends that the shoulder is one of the most mobile regions of the body. No, no other joint in the body has so much movement. The other thing the shoulder has is it can move faster than any other joint in the body. It, uh, it exhibits more, more speed, more velocity than anywhere else. In fact, if you sort of think about the need for speed, some of the hardest things to do with the human shoulder is to pitch in baseball. So some baseball pitches have been clocked at the ball, move, ball speed at around about 170 kilometers an hour. What that means is that you have to go from cocking position to ball release, that's about 80 degrees, and you've got to do that in about 30 milliseconds. So that means you're generating about 9,000 degrees a second of speed. You're not actually moving 9,000 degrees, that would cause other problems, but you're moving very quickly uh, in a short period of time. Once you've let the ball go, whether it's baseball, connecting with a tennis ball, throwing a boomerang at a tasty looking kangaroo you want to take home for dinner, once you've thrown something at an object, you then have to deaccelerate your shoulder. You have to apply an eccentric brake. And the sum of the speeds, the deacceleration speeds, are impossible to comprehend. Deacceleration can be around about half a million degrees a second squared. So the shoulder is doing incredible things. And it is totally dependent on muscle, totally, main, mainly dependent on muscle tissue for stability and for uh, movement. And that makes it so exciting for us as clinicians because we are really experts at assessing muscle function and, um, and treating muscle function. So you're sitting there thinking, I probably wish I had another sandwich at lunchtime, but you're also sitting there thinking, why would be the evolutionary advantage of having such a mobile shoulder and such a fast shoulder? What would be the reason we have such, a, such an important part of our body? Humans can't, defend them. Humans can't defend ourselves. We don't have venom, we don't have claws, we don't have fangs, except on Twitter. Um, but what 
one of the paleo anthropologist arguments as to why we stood in the savannah in Africa, there's a whole lot of theories. But one of the theories that we initially stood was that we could present ourselves to predators presenting an unusual form. And we also started to have upper limbs that could maybe pick up sticks and throw sticks and stones at leaves at predators so we could defend a carcass that maybe we found early on in our evolutionary past. Over time, that changed and we could not only uh, throw uh, rocks and stones for, for short distances, our shoulders evolved and then we could use rocks and spears to be able to actually not only defend carcasses but to kill animals so we could take them home to the local cave and have enjoy a nice evening meal. So that was sort of the evolutionary argument for developing the shoulder that we've got. So if we look at comparative anatomy, there are things we can do and there are things that we can't do. And this impacts upon our patients as well. So you can throw. You can throw faster and harder than any primate on the planet. Nobody can do what you can do. But if you look at the angle that you throw at, that humans throw at, it's under 90 degrees, because that puts our pectoralis major in a good mechanical advantage to develop an incredible force to throw with speed, whether it's a spear, a boomerang, or a tennis ball, or a baseball. Primates can't do that. Orangutans, chimpanzees, chimpanzees can throw, but they can throw at around about 50 kilometers an hour for short distances. You can throw three or four times faster than that. And one of the reasons is it comes down to the anatomy of the shoulder. But what primates can do is they can brachiate. They can hold on their body weight for ages on a tree, on a branch. They can hold their whole body weight with one arm. They can swing through trees. We can't do that very efficiently. And it comes down to, again, to our anatomy. So if we look at our thorax today, it's very barrel-shaped. Three million years ago, it was very triangular, which is the same as a chimpanzee thorax today. The, the relevance of this is that your scapula is not resting in an upwardly rotated position on your thorax. Your scapula is very flat on your thorax, whereas a triangular thorax is brilliant for having a scapula placed in an upwardly rotated position. In addition to this, your glenoid fossa faces laterally whereas this glenoid fossa faces more superiorly. So not only is the scapula upwardly rotated, the glenoid fossa faces upwardly, so you've got a fantastic base of support for the humeral head if you want to brachiate, swing through trees, and climb. We don't have that adaptation. Our acromion sits over the head of our humerus. Three million years ago, or a primate, it sat quite vertically. And the final thing that we can talk about in terms of biomechanics is that your clavicle, the only weight-bearing strut between the sternum and the whole upper limb, your clavicle is very flat, which means your acromion is weight-bearing off the end of a very flat clavicle, whereas a chimpanzee has an upward flare on its lateral end, which means the, acro which means the acromion and scapula is already being supported in an upwardly rotated position. The reason why I'm started with this is because there are, this does have an impact on our clinical practice. So if you look at some Swedish studies that take people, men, who've been working hard physically for 10 years, hard physically under 90 degrees or hard physically above 90 degrees, people whose jobs are above 90 degrees are more prone to shoulder pain, such as dentists, such as hairdressers, such as house painters, such as builders. And that will be relevant for certain patient groups that come to your clinic, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. The other thing that makes you very special is you've got a pelvis that can rotate considerably, more than any other primate on the planet, and more than your ancestors did as well. And this is of critical relevance for clinical practice. Because when you, are, when you throw, when you serve in tennis, whether you're throwing a beach ball to friends on the beach, or you're serving in tennis, or you're playing baseball, you don't stand and throw. You put your whole body into that action. You transfer your weight from your back leg to your front leg, you rotate your pelvis, and that action is actually sending, transmitting, about 50% of the force in a tennis serve and in a baseball pitch. And the shoulder is only contributing a small amount, about 20% of the force available for a lot of the functions that we're doing. We know, as I said, this is probably one of the hardest things to do on the planet. Not only do you have to suffer the embarrassment of doing it wearing your pajamas, 
um, you're st and standing on a piece of mud. These guys are throwing with incredible speed and incredible precision, but the only way to generate the forces they're doing is sending energy from the lower limb into the shoulder. If you've got stiffness in the hip, if you've got weakness in the pelvis, if you've got hallux rigidus on your standing foot, you can't generate that same sort of force. And if you've got a 25% decrease in force transference from the lower limb into the shoulder, the shoulder has to find an extra 35% power to throw and deliver at the same speed, the same speed as previously. Now just think about that, 35%, what does that mean? Imagine you are running on a treadmill in the gym at your top speed. Maybe that's 10 kilometers an hour. And then all of a sudden, somebody comes up and switches the dial up to 13.5 kilometers an hour. How long can you stay on that treadmill without something failing? So very often, patients will come to our clinics and they'll say, my shoulder's sore. And so we might give a bit of exercise, we might give a bit of manual therapy, put a bit of tape on, whatever it is we do, our patients settle down, they go back to whatever it is they're doing, whether they're house painters, builders, sports people, and they're back in two months. But they're probably not back to see us because we didn't do a good job. They're going off to see somebody else, one of your competitors. And maybe one of the reasons for that is we've limited our assessment to the area where the patient's experiencing symptoms, but maybe not to the area where the deficit is occurring. So I remember when I trained in Australia, we were told, look at the shoulder, look at the neck, that constitutes an efficient physiotherapy assessment. It clearly doesn't. We have to come up with systems, not screening the body to prevent problems, I don't know if we can do that, but we have to come up with a system that when somebody comes into our clinic, that we're considering the whole kinetic chain as part of our assessment. And maybe something as simple as weak quads, weak gastrocoeliac muscles may be part of the reason why our patients continue to have ongoing shoulder symptoms, possibly. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is the assessment conundrum, making a clinical diagnosis, trying to inform ourselves to come up with a, a clinical reasoning process to tell the patient what this is what you're suggesting may be of benefit for them. So shoulder assessment is, is very complex and we're making complicated decisions in highly ambiguous situations. And we've heard a lot about that in this, in this conference so far in the last 24 hours. So when a patient comes in, as part of our conversation and discussion, we've got to try and clinically reason and understand the complex psychological factors that may be influencing this patient that are deep and interwoven and complicated, but somehow we've got to try and interpret that to understand what's going on with the patient. We have to consider, is, is there any possibility that the pain might be referred from the neck, from the thorax, from the abdomen? We have to consider, is part of the problem a stiff shoulder? And there's many reasons to have a stiff shoulder. It could be a frozen shoulder, it could be an osteosarcoma, and even within the frozen shoulder subcategory, there are probably five or six different subcategories within that as well. We need to consider, is posture involved? We need to consider, as part of the problem, instability, hypermobility. We also have to consider the possibility of soft tissue involvement, bursal tissue, rotator cuff tissue, muscle and tendon. And then we've got all these complicated pain mechanisms, whether it's central sensitization or, or peripheral sensitization of tissue. And that's hard and complicated to do. And it's even more complicated because it's often that, isn't it? And we've got to try and unpick the different things that are going on. So how do we address this diagnostic conundrum? So we sit down, we ask patients to tell us about their problem, why they've come to see us, what they're hoping to get from the interaction with us. We, so we have a conversation, a discussion with our patients. We give them outcome measures to fill in for the shoulder, depending on where you are in the world. It might be the spady, the dash, the constant score, the Oxford shoulder score, but we give some questionnaire that allows the patient to inform us about what they are able to do and not able to do. And we use that as a measure of, of where they are at the moment, but also how they change during our interaction with us. We measure impairment, we measure range of movement, strength and pain. And we perform special orthopedic tests that have been designed to try and identify which structure is responsible for the patient's symptoms. And we may support our clinical assessment with imaging. What I'd like to devote a little bit of this conversation to is these two features here, the special orthopedic tests and the role of imaging in, the, in, in their ability to inform our clinical practice. 
So we've got all these special tests, and there's probably 100, 101 of them that we've all spent time learning to do, that some of these tests are used to um, identify conditions such as impingement, or maybe identify the involvement of a structure such as the rotator cuff. And we could ask ourselves a question when we're in our clinical practice, what do we actually know about these special tests? I guess one of the first things we've got to say is multiple narrative and systematic reviews from wherever you look at them consistently are telling us that these special tests can't tell us or can't differentiate structures. They can't tell us where the symptoms are coming from. So what I guess we could uh, summarise from that is these special tests aren't special at all. They are tests that are really good at reproducing symptoms, but they are not good at telling us where the symptoms are coming from. And let's just have a look at some of the reasons why that's the case. So all of us will have learnt the supraspinatus test, the full can and empty can test, that we're told in the Roman emperor position you're going to die. If it's more painful, more weak in this position, that indicates that it's probably some sort of supraspinatus involvement in our patient's uh, shoulder present condition. However, not possible. Why isn't it possible? Because if we look at some studies that where they put needle EMG around the shoulder muscles, they're telling us that eight muscles are working equally hard during the full CAN test, and nine muscles are working equally hard during the empty CAN test. So you're not able to say with any confidence at all, I'm testing the supraspinatus during this procedure. And we know that these tests don't have any real validity in coming up with a diagnosis of supraspinatus muscle or tendon involvement. They are great when the patient says it's sore to say, yes, your shoulder's sore, but not telling us why the shoulder's sore. So you've all learnt tests for infraspinatus, subscapularis, supraspinatus, and that's really much based on an anatomical premise that we're testing one structure per test. Now, if we were testing one structure per test, that just might be possible. But that's not the way the shoulder's designed. We've got a really big ball sitting on a really small socket that probably three or four times larger than the socket that sometimes has to tuck your shirt in, sometimes has to pitch baseballs at 170 kilometers an hour. And there's no way, if you were given the job of stabilizing this ball and socket, you wouldn't put one tendon here, one tendon on top, and one tendon at the back you would make a structure, as is the structure of the rotator cuff, where everything's interwoven and meshing together. So we've got fibres of teres minor inseparably joining fibres of infraspinatus, inseparably joining fibres of supraspinatus. Supraspinatus joins subscapularis to make a covering around the biceps, and that's just at one horizontal level. These guys, Clark and Harriman, were telling us back in the 1990s that it's not just at one horizontal level, we've got five separate tissue layers where we've got interweaving not only at one level, but through the levels as well, joining up with capsula and ligamentous tissue. So that clearly tells us that this can't be a test, these tests can't be testing individual structures. It's even more complicated than that because you've got lots of bursi in the shoulder. They develop in response to friction. And the biggest subacromial subdeltoid bursa, like all the other bursae in the shoulder, they're innervated. So we know the subacromial bursa is innervated by branches of the suprascapular nerve, a C5, C6 nerve posteriorly, and it's innervated anteriorly by branches of the lateral pectoral nerve. All the bursae in the shoulder are innervated by sensory branches of C5 and C6 nerves. Now, there's no muscle in bursal tissue, so it can't be motor innovation, it's sensory innovation. We know there's some argument that the bursae contribute to the sensory motor control of the shoulder. What we also know is there's lots of chemicals identified in biopsies of bursal tissue in people who, who have shoulder pain that are not there in people without shoulder pain or at much lower concentrations. These are not great studies, but these are as good as it gets at the moment studies. And what we have is some studies from Japan where they take people with shoulder pain and they find, find co high concentrations of the negatively charged neuropeptide, substance P, in high concentration in the, uh, in the bursal tissue. And not only is it there in high concentrations, the people who are saying I've got seven, eight, nine, ten out of 10 pain have higher concentrations of substance P and pro-inflammatory cytokines such as the interleukin. 
So maybe part of the pain mechanism is chemical stimulation on nerves that somehow transmit that to, to higher centres for a patient to, to perceive they've got pain coming from their shoulder. Now the problem with that is all the tests you've learnt, such as the supraspinatus test, we're told we're testing a tendon. I've said to you a minute ago that's not possible because of the uh, way the shoulder muscles and tendons are designed, but it's even further complicated by the fact that that can't be a supraspinatus test. Why isn't that a subacromial bursal stretch test? It could be equally bursal stretching and compression as well. And you must have asked the question, on the morning that you learnt the supraspinatus full and empty cans test, and then you went off to have a cup of coffee, and you came back after the break, and then the teacher said, now we're going to learn the O'Brien test. And you're saying, that's interesting, that looks like the supraspinatus test, but it's now 15 degrees to the left. Um, it looks exactly the same, but now I'm being told that's a labrum test. You should have asked the question, did somebody put Botox in the supraspinatus during the break, because it's you know, exactly the same tests. How do we know it's only testing the labrum? Why is it not a subacromial, a subcoracoid bursal compression test? So we've got this problem that the, the tests that we use are good at reproducing pain, but not great at um, telling us where the pain's coming from. So our first major conundrum is that we can't make an effective clinical diagnosis. The second thing I'd like to look at is the use of imaging in clinical practice. So we're really lucky. Since 1895, that's when the first x-rays were available to us. When they were available to us, for the first time ever in human history, we could see under the skin to see what was going on. And there's been an assumption, if we can see something that's different, that must tell us where the symptoms are coming from. What's really worrying, very similar to the low back pain research, there's a really frightening, a really alarming, poor correlation between imaging in the shoulder and symptoms that the patient may be experiencing, or symptoms they may not, or, or, or lack of symptoms. So there's, I'm not sure how many people here, let's say a thousand people in this room at the moment, probably 200 of you, if we went out to the uh, stands and got the ultrasounds out, 200 of you will have a rotator cuff tear. But of that 200, only 70 of that 200 will actually have shoulder symptoms, and the other remain that the vast majority of people with a tear won't have symptoms. More people have symptomat asymptomatic tears than symptomatic tears. So ultrasound, really common, beautiful. The pictures that ultrasound can generate are phenomenal. It's, it's just a brilliant thing to watch. We can see partial thickness tears in ultrasound scans of the shoulder tendons. We can see full thickness tears. So a black area in, a, in an ultrasound scan where it normally should be white would indicate a, a rotator cuff tear. Easy to see, relatively easy to see. And we can measure the size of the tear. But is it informing us of clinic in, in terms of our clinical practice? If we go back to a really interesting study done by a, a very brilliant orthopedic surgeon back in the 1990s, he was, he was questioning a lot about orthopaedic practice, Chuck Milgram, and he took 90 people from the ages of 40 to 99 who had no history of shoulder pain, that, not that they could remember, and certainly not for the last year and have had no treatment ever that they could remember for their shoulder. And what he reported in this particular study was about 50% of people without shoulder pain had partial or full thickness tears of their rotator cuff tissues. More recently, now that, that, that was, that was uh, a study done in 1995, and in 1995, people were scanning at seven megahertz. That's about seven million sound cycles a second to produce then were considered amazing pictures. Today, no one would look at a seven megahertz scanner. People today are boasting about their 10 megahertz, 12 megahertz, 14 megahertz scanners, so they're producing much more defined, definitive pictures. So when we look at more modern research that uh, people are using higher quality, higher frequency scanners, they're no longer telling us that it's 50% of people without symptoms have got structural failure. They're now telling us it's 96% of people without symptoms have got structural failure. And who would want to be in the 4% that don't have it? I would want to be with the majority. But you, um, you'll get, um, you, you will get uh, ultrasound scan reports that tell you about bursal thickening, rotator cuff tears, labral tears, you know, and you say, well, that's not a job for me. That has to be a job for a surgeon. What could I possibly do in the presence of st such 
substantial structural pathology. But all these findings are in people without symptoms. This was a career-changing paper for me. I couldn't understand it when I read it. I thought someone had slipped class A drugs into my, um, into my coffee. Because um, at this stage, if you could get an MRI, that was going to answer every question about where your pain was coming from. So this is, this is a study that was published in 1999. And I honestly couldn't understand what I was reading. But what this study tells us is that if you take 42 people with a diagnosis of impingement syndrome, whatever that means, and then you take 31 people age-matched without any symptoms and you put them through an MRI scanner, you find that exactly the same number of people with symptoms and without symptoms have exactly the same tears. So what can an MRI tell us about where the symptoms are coming from? It can identify structural failure, but how can we with confidence say your symptoms are coming from that structural failure? Take these guys again, the, the upper end human shoulder function people. So if you have a look at this study, you take this, these guys are pitching, as I said, baseballs at 170 kilometers an hour with incredible precision. You tell a baseball pitcher to hit that green dot, if I could hold it still, he or she would hit that green dot with incredible precision. So, but if you scan them, um, you know, if you, uh, if you, if you scan a, these asymptomatic upper end human shoulder function people, a, that are asymptomatic, 80% of them have rotator cuff tears in their throwing shoulder, 90% of them have tears in their catching shoulder, they've all got labral tears, none of them have got symptoms. And more modern studies say that as well. Um, if, you, um, if you melt me down, I'm probably worth about two euros, um, all the chemicals that I've got in my body. These guys are worth 30 million, 50 million dollars, so they're scanned all the time to make sure things are okay. If someone's going to buy them or they're going to move to a new club, or they'll be scanned before they're purchased. So we've got lots of long-term data on elite level shoulders. And what's really interesting, that the previous studies suggest that you can be functioning at the highest level of human shoulder function with pretty substantial tears, but when you follow them for five years, they've still got no symptoms. So it's very difficult, again, to be certain how much we can rely on imaging to inform our clinical practice. So our second conundrum is imaging can't really tell us where the pain's coming from. And actually the biggest predictor of having a rotator cuff tear is getting older. And that starts for the shoulder at around about 35 years of age. This has really serious implications because last week or today, yesterday in Glasgow and in your hometowns, people will have had rotator cuff tests and the clinical suspicion will be supraspinatus pathology They'll get up, then go off and have ultrasound scans or MRIs, which will confirm the clinical suspicion. So I don't know what percentage of people today, maybe 50 or 60% of people today, are having operations on tissues that are not causing their symptoms, which is expensive for the health systems, it is expensive for the individual, and it's very wasteful, based on clinical tests and imaging tests that can't really tell us where the symptoms are coming from. And we've tried to develop some patient education information documents that you're very welcome to download. You're very welcome to tell us how they could be improved. Um, but just trying to sort of bridge this gap in terms of the fear that patients have when they come in saying, my life's fallen apart, I've got a partial thickness tear, I don't know what I'm doing here, surely I need an operation to fix this. Um, what, could a, what could a bit of exercise do to help me? So the third conundrum I'd like to talk about is, is the role of posture. And good posture has always been associated from the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Greeks, has always been associated with good health. And you can see you know, examples of perfect seating posture in statues from ancient Egypt. Let me introduce you to the three winners of Miss Perfect Posture 1956 um, at the um, chiropractic conference in Chicago. I mean, would that not go to the top of your CV? Um, <laughs> Go on mind. So what they did is they chose the people who had the best looking posture and they confirmed it with x-rays. Um, we've also got textbooks that tell us about uh, posture and perfect posture and changes in muscles when we don't have perfect posture and deviations from perfect posture. And we use this to inform our clinical practice, we use this to tell our patients what's going on and we use this to tell our students, this is what you've got to look for, this is what we all help you understand what's going wrong with the patient. 
So we were told in 1947 by the American Academy of Orthopaedic Surgeons that this is how you have to stand. There was, for those of you who are research savvy here, there was no 95% confidence interval. There was no deviation from this. It was this, it was binary. It was this, and any deviation from this was considered abnormal. And we've got texts that tell us any deviation from this ideal normal is associated with uh, conditions, muscle imbalances, and we need to identify it and we need to correct it. So we're told if you're slightly kyphotic, you're going to have rounded shoulders, pec muscles are going to be tight, the upper trapezius is going to be tight, it's going to lift the scapula up, pull the scapula forwards, and we're going to get impingement when we lift up our arms. So we improve this and our patients get better. So the hypothesis is very simple. You've got good posture, your scapula's aligned properly, you can lift your arm up without any problems, and if you've got a forward head posture, your scapula tilts forwards, and when you lift your arm up, you impinge the soft tissues under the acromion, and that explains where the symptoms are coming from. And people have been forever talking about treating poor posture. So you can go back 100 years in this country and find the thoracic kyphosis straightening machine where you kneel, you get strapped in, the, the clinician tries to straighten your thoracic spine. We've got very worrying treatments that seem to be a bit um, of concern and you can have this and you can and you can have uh, you can have this buggy that you can walk around all day first four-wheel drive, I think, ever invented, um, that you can walk around all day while having your posture improved. And of course, all these treatments then became the inspiration for the number one bestseller, The Fifty Shades of Grey. So we tell, your patient, we tell our patients, it's your posture. And that's probably the same as we heard in the brilliant lectures before lunch, you know, so telling your patient, it's a disc herniation. That's the same thing. I think that that's how our patients are processing that information. Now, there's probably, from my reckoning, from what I can understand from different websites, about 570 physios, chiropractors, and osteopaths around the world. If they're each seeing 10 patients a day, and they tell three of their patients that it's your posture, that means 34 million people a month are being told it's your posture, and about half a billion people a year are being told you've got a disc herniation, but in physio talk. That's probably what we're doing. We're telling people that this is the reason for your symptoms. And do we have any evidence for that? Well, is it our posture? So over the years, I've done, been involved with colleagues with quite a lot of studies on posture. Some of them I'm embarrassed about now, but some of them I'm still okay about. Um, and here's just some examples. So with, this is a study we did. We put um, markers on different anat anatomical landmarks. We hammer nails into C7s. Um, and we were then able to generate information about forward head posture, kyphosis, scapular position, and correlate it to shoulder range of movement in people with and without shoulder symptoms, and found absolutely no correlation. You could be incredibly kyphotic and have normal range of shoulder movement, etc. We've looked at some of the muscle length tests that have been published. And I can tell you some of these tests are incredibly reliable, but an incredible waste of time because there is no difference between people with and without symptoms when you're assessing them with these tests. Uh, a study that was published in BJSM last year, uh, led by Liz Radcliffe, she did a systematic review, synthesizing the information she could find on scapular posture in people with impingement. Because we're told in impingement that as, when, you, when you're standing, your forwards, your scapula's coming forwards, and it's impinging into the, rotator, uh, into the subacromial space. Her synthesis of the literature clearly said there is no typical scapular posture in people with impingement. So I think there's a, a, a popular misconception that you know, this thing about upper trapezius that we worry about. So uh, yesterday, the, we were told that one of the things that physios love to do is pelvic tilt. I think the thing that physios most love to do is set the scapula. You know, that's the other thing. So can you imagine walking along pelvic tilting and setting the scapula at the same time? That would be an interesting, uh, that would be an interesting funny walk, wouldn't it? And we set the scapula to readdress the balance between the upper trapezius and the lower trapezius. So what I'd like to do now is the fastest and largest cohort study in human history. We're going to publish this. We're all going to be co-authors. I'd like you all to stand up, please. Can we turn some lights on, if that's possible? Other lights to turn on? What I'd like you to do is I'd like one of you become friends with the person next to you, high-five them, introduce yourself. What I'd, what, 
what I'd like, what I'd like you to... That's enough, I'm running out of time. Um, <laughs> I, just, I just realized I'm in trouble. Okay, so um, what I'd like you to do is one of you offer a bat your back to your partner. So turn one of you off your back. You can make Brazilian congas if you want to. Now this has to be done, whoops, this has to be done in um, research conditions because we want to publish. So no one is allowed to talk from this point onwards. If you are facing your partner's back, I want you to put one finger on the medial border of the spine of the scapula, the other finger on the lateral border of the spine of the scapula, and even if you can't find it, just with confidence, pretend you're on it, okay? <laughs> So, what I'd like you to do now, if you're being palpated, I would like you to create the worst muscle imbalance known to man. I want you to elevate your scapula in the direction of the ear. Just lift your shoulder up. And if you're palpating, do it a couple of times. If you're palpating, without talking, if you're palpating, I want you to answer the question that was going to be form our research data for our research study. Is the scapula moving? Is it moving symmetrically? or is one side moving more than another? Once you've answered that question, turn around and offer your partner your shoulder blade. No talking, we can't publish. Okay, that's all the time you've got. All right, have a seat. So, so let's, let's answer the questions. Let's, the, the, uh, these are binary answers. It's either yes or no, we, see, whatever language you want to answer in. So, did the scapula move? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Did it move symmetrically, meaning both fingers moved at exactly the same level? Well, this is going to be a 100% cohort study. Never been done in history before. Did that mean one side moved more than another? Was it the outside that moved more? This is just a guess. Okay, so what have we just proven in this cohort study of a thousand scapulae? No one, this is, this is worthy of the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, so we, we, we can say that this thing of elevation isn't elevation at all. If the outside, if the outside is moving, um, if, if we're getting more movement on the outside, it's not elevation, it's upward rotation. So what that's simply going to tell us is that if you've got impingement, the last thing you'd want to do is set the scapula to downly rotate and depress the sh sh shoulder, because what that's going to do is it's going to impinge the acromion into the subacromial space. Now, I don't believe anything I'm saying at the moment. I'm, I've got my fingers crossed. In this country, you're allowed to lie if you cross your fingers or if you write it in 18 feet letters on the side of a bus. That also allows you to lie. <laughs> so, which is sad, isn't it? All right, so what, um, so, so what our third conundrum clearly tells us is that posture doesn't follow the rules in the literature. So we've arrived, I think, at an uncertain and confusing professional crossroad. We've got this conundrum where we can't make, we differentiate tissues, we can't confirm a diagnosis, and posture doesn't follow defined patterns in the literature. So what are we going to do? We can continue to assess posture, we can use special tests, we can continue to be guided by imaging, or we can come up with a plan B. And there are many plan Bs. And in healthcare, if you know there's more than one treatment, it means we know nothing. Okay, so it simply means we just don't know the best way to move forwards, no matter what people tell you. So years ago, when I was trying to stay at work and trying to be honest at work, I thought, well, I can't use a clinical test, I can't use imaging, I need a system for me that helps me address the problems that the patient has identified to me that they want fixing. So I called this process the shoulder symptom modification procedure, and it took me a long time to have the courage to publish it because I thought I'd be busking the next day because I'd be out of a job. So the way that <coughs> this system works is it's not fail safe, but the way the system works is the patient identifies what they want fixed. And it might be something like some exercise in the gym, it might be tucking their shirt in, it might be a swimming movement, it might be some, some vocation that they're involved in. So that's the first thing, because if I can change it, I'm hoping I might improve adherence to management if the patient has identified a problem and I've been able to demonstrate I can partially or maybe even more sometimes improve their symptoms. 
And then I go through three different stages, looking at the role of the kyphosis on symptoms, scapular position, and humeral head position on symptoms. And we've got a little bit of evidence, not a great amount of evidence, to, to, to justify the use of this. So we've got studies where we've got, um, we've taken patients with people with shoulder pain, we've measured their shoulder flexion and abduction, we've changed their kyphosis, and we know through Eva Barrett's PhD through the University of Limerick that this is a reliable and a valid measure of the kyphosis. And in the very short term, we see some patients get substantially better, substantial improvements in range of movement, some people get worse, and some people don't change. So that might give us some indication in certain people that changing the kyphosis may be of some benefit for them. Um, we're doing research, we've got the privilege of doing research with colleagues around the world at the moment in different areas, and one of the studies we're doing with uh, Professor Marco Barbero, who's in, 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 in at, the, at the conference with other colleagues, we're doing some research in the, uh, at SUPSI and Lugano in Switzerland, we're doing some research looking at the kinematics of some of the components of this procedure. Um, later this afternoon, I strongly recommend you go and listen to Dr. Rachel Chester's uh, 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 presentation in the free paper session. She'll be presenting the work she's done for her phenomenal PhD. Um, Rachel was looking at prognostic stuff, what, what predicts good outcome at six months in a physiotherapy assessment. Uh, she did a multi-centre cohort study of 1,030 people. So that's a pretty big study. At six months, she had data to, to collect from 800 people. Um, and what did she find? Not a surprise, based on what we've heard already at the conference, that psychological variables are the biggest predictors of outcome at six months. But interestingly, what she also found was the scapular component of the SSMP, but also the way other people use it as well, such as Ben Kibler. If you can get a change with the scapular component today, it might help you get a bottle of wine, a box of chocolates, a bunch of flowers in six months' time. Um, we've also just finished a reliability study on the SSMP that we're currently writing up for publication. This was international. We had uh, here, Ireland, America, and Keele University. I think that's part of the UK. Um, and, um, and we had 40, um, we had 40 uh, clinician participants in this reliability study, mainly physios. Some of the osteopaths didn't turn up. Um, we were doing, we looked at the, the influence of long training on the SSMP and short training, and we had 11 patient participants. And the clinician participants had to rate if the different components of the SSMP were making the patients better, no change, worse, partially better or completely better. Um, we found that partial and complete improvement happened 72% of the time, but there was also some patients who said, I'm getting worse or not changing. We use something called Crippendorf's Alpha to look at the uh, reliability of this, which is the same as uh, the Kappa statistic in terms of zero means you're rubbish, one means you're perfect. And what we found was that the uh, reliability, this inter-tester reliability, I'm not presenting the other, other um, findings just for the sake of time, um, that we found that they range from 0.76 to 0.93, which means very good to excellent to near perfect reliability. It's encouraging, but it doesn't tell us that it's the acceptable alternative at the moment because we don't have any data for long-term use of this process. So that's a long way to go, but it's the start of uh, a possible way of trying to help the patient who comes for seeking assistance in your clinic, but not being able to come up with a definitive structural diagnosis or being able to rely totally on imaging. And the other thing that I find the SSMP very useful for, we heard it this morning, sometimes patients will come in and you ask them what's wrong and they'll say, oh, it's my C5, C6. So you know it's not that, it's they're telling you what somebody else has told them. And sometimes patients will come in and say, well, it's my posture. I've been told so many times, it's my posture, it's my disc bulge, which is the equivalent. Or they've looked on Dr. Google and Dr. Google has told them it's their posture. And sometimes one of the things that's very valuable with the SSMP, when it shows no change, that you can say, you can have, then have a conversation with your patient saying, well, I've been through all the postural tests, I can't seem to change it. So maybe initially it was thought that it was posture, but at the moment I can't find evidence for that. So maybe you can reclaim some of the yellow flag that's been given to the patient from somebody else. I'd like to, with a little bit of time I've got left, to talk about the management conundrum. 
And I don't have time to talk about all different conditions, but I'm going to talk about the one that's most diagnosed. And that comes under the category of impingement syndrome, bursitis, rotator cuff tendinopathy, um, partial thickness tears, full thickness tears. I, I, the term I use for this is rotator cuff related shoulder pain, which for me is just a way of saying shoulder pain and giving the patient some impression that I know something, even though, as you know, if you cross your fingers, you're allowed to lie. So there's lots of ways to treat rotator cuff related shoulder pain. There's advice, there's exercise, there's manual therapy, there's surgery, injections, electrotherapy, acupuncture, shock wave and taping. To start this story, we've got to go back to 1972, which the, was the year that Deep Purple's Smoke on the Water was the number one international bestseller. It was also the year you could buy the first handheld pocket calculator for the rock bottom price of only 400 American dollars, and for that money, it didn't even come with a battery. <laughs> it was also the year that Charles Neer, a very famous American orthopedic surgeon, published a paper and said 95% of all rotator cuff problems are caused by irritation by the acromion, recommending the acromioplasty procedure. If you go back to this paper and his 1983 paper, you'll recognize them today as not as research papers, but as blogs. This is what I think is happening. This is what I think I'm observing. It wasn't research, but it was accepted as this is what's going on in the shoulder. And there's an assumption that the symptoms are coming from the acromion, um, and it's causing damage to the tissues and damaging the tendon. And you know, the, the most sad statements are made by some patients when they come into clinical practice. You know, I know my acromion is ripping into my tendon. I've got to have it cut off. Uh, my symptoms are coming from my tear. If I don't operate on this past small tear, it's going to become so big and, and inoperable. So what it seems to suggest that surgery is required to rectify this structural fault. And we know in America there's been a massive increase in the number of acromioplasties performed. Same in the UK, a 750% increase in this 10-year period. Now, of course, if it's working, get it done, get more done. But the research doesn't seem to make sense based on this huge increase in the number of acromioplasties. So this is a very interesting study done by a, a, a doctor from the Netherlands, Dr. Henkes, where he took people with impingement, with this acromion problem, he randomized them to an acromioplasty and a bursectomy, which is what the surgeons will do, and the other group just had a bursectomy. And what did he find at two and a half years? No difference in outcomes. And three other studies have said the same thing. There's also been a massive increase in the number of rotator cuff repairs. And I guess most of your clinics, where they're being, with most of the patients you're seeing, they have been done arthroscopically, haven't they? Because it's a day in hospital, less infection, better outcomes, we can visualize better. Um, lots of reasons why it's been done arthroscopically. So there's an assumption that the symptoms are coming from the structural faults, whether it's the acromion or whether it's the rotator cuff. However, these American studies seem to suggest that there's no correlation with pain with the size of the tear, with the amount of tendon retraction, or actually any clinical findings. Pain seems to correlate, pain seems to correlate with the number of comorbidities. So every time you ask a patient a question, have you got diabetes? Yes. Have you got heart disease? Yes. Have you got high blood pressure? Yes. Every time they're saying yes, you know you're moving further away from a bottle of wine at the end of the interaction with the patient. <laughs> and very sadly, what it also correlates with is level of education. And the, the brilliant lecture we heard in the, before, in the earlier session about health literacy, it relates to that. And that's just such a sad statement in all our societies. And you're not going to get clever by having a surgical operation. There's no evidence for that either. This is a really important study to be aware of. It's called the UCUF study. It was done in this country and published last October. And what they wanted to look at here was the best treatment for full thickness tears. So they randomized the patients to open and arthroscopic repairs for the full thickness tears. They used something called the Oxford Shoulder Score, where it ranges from zero, meaning you're rubbish, 48, meaning you couldn't be any better. Both groups started the same, and both groups had substantial improvement following the surgical intervention. But that's when it starts to get really interesting. Because look, they looked at retear rate with MRI at one year, and what did they find? That the open group, 38% of them, 39% of them, had, were retorn. 
and the arthroscopic group, 46% of them are retorn. So if you're going to have surgery, are you going to go for the better cosmesis or the technique that has the best outcome? Or are you even going to go to surgery? Because look at this. This is a really sit up and take notice conversation that you have to have with your surgical colleagues. If you are to have a difference in the Oxford shoulder score, you've got a difference between groups. You've got to have a difference of at least five or six between the different groups. What do they find? Arthroscopic and intact at one year, 44.5. Open and intact, 43.6. Um, failed at one year, 41.8. Open and failed, 40.8. There are no differences between the groups. So the outcome is not dependent upon the structural intactness of the surgery. That's a big gasping breath we should have. So it must suggest that there are factors other than the surgery that are responsible for the outcome. We also don't know if we're just mapping natural history because we don't have any non-treatment groups, placebo groups, um, control groups. A really important paper to read is this paper where they've synthesized information on the potential of surgery and other invasive procedures as a placebo. And what they tell us is that if pain is the main presentation, such as an impingement, such as in rotator cuff failure, then surgery has got the greatest potential of being a placebo. You need to read this paper. We know that. We know we've got studies, interesting studies. No study's perfect, but these studies are really important because we know there are people having these procedures today um, where people with OA knee, this study wanted to know if a washout procedure or a debridement procedure where they washed out the knee and made it all look beautiful inside, put in a vase with flowers to make it look pristine, um, <laughs> compared to just a skin incision, and at six month, one year, two year follow up, what did they say? No difference between the groups. $3 billion worth of placebo in New York State every year. This study, and there'll be people today all around the world having their medial meniscus repaired. This study also says it's probably nothing more than a placebo procedure. So maybe that's one of the reasons some of our patients get better after shoulder surgery. What happens after surgery? You don't drive home, do you? You don't go home and do the ironing or the vacuuming. You have a period of relative rest. In Australia, non-manual workers, this is not after rotator cuff repair, this is just for impingement, or de subacromial decompression. It's much longer, uh, much longer uh, uh, relative rest after rotator cuff repair. So in Australia, non-manual workers, six weeks to get back to work, manual workers, 12 weeks, and it takes about 30 days to get back to driving. In the UK, nine days, three weeks, 13 days. I don't know if this means Australians are lazy or British people are stupid, but it does seem to suggest that there's a substantial period of time after surgery where there is relative rest. Now, what's the management for most rotator cuff tendon related problems? Lots of education and we load manage the tissue. We try and stop the tissue uh, reduce, uh, we don't stop the tissue, but we try and manage the load through that tissue. And then we give a graduated exercise program. And that's exactly what happens after surgery. So we don't know, because there doesn't seem to be a difference between the groups that are failing and not failing in surgery, but maybe the benefit of the surgery is 5,000 pounds or $5,000, wherever it costs where you come from. Maybe it's a, a placebo or enforced relative rest and graduated... Um, graduated re reloading and exercise. So that's a very expensive way to get that treatment. There are other potential arguments as well. So you've seen, this is for the people involved in the shoulder, this is called the foot, um, and um, this is called a swollen posterior part of the leg, and that you might see that in a condition you might be diagnosing with Achilles tendinopathy. So you see swelling sometimes in tendons that have been overloaded. Now, if you were to put that swelling there, it sort of changes the paradigm a little bit. And so the surgeons are saying it's the acromion pushing down that's the issue, but also it could be a swollen tendon pushing up. And I'm not going to go through this now because I'm desperately running out of time, but I'd strongly recommend you go and listen to Karen McCreese's PhD work later this afternoon, where she's going to present some phenomenal data um, on what happens when you exercise or overload people with rotator cuff tendinopathy, and what you'll see is their tendon swells. Now, we don't know if that's the answer to the questions at the moment, but there is alternative hypotheses 
in addition to this acromial pushing down model. And if it is the soft tissue that's failing, then that's where you guys are perfect to come in and try and restore homeostasis to those tissues. In terms of management, we've published a few times on different ways to treat rotator cuff related shoulder pain. And I'm just going to talk very briefly about one of the uh, potential clinical classifications. And before I do that, I'm just going to ask you a question. If you'd woken up this morning and started coughing and had a temperature and felt really unwell, and you found just so you managed to go and see a GP, a family doctor, a doctor, or went to the accident and emergency department, and the doctor says to you, oh my gosh, this is the worst case of pneumonia I have ever seen. I've never seen it so bad. I'm going to give you the third best sort of antibiotics that I could possibly give you for this condition. You'd be sitting there thinking, whoa, I've been a good boy all year. Any chance of having the second best sort of antibiotics? And if it was your mum, your dad, your husband, your wife, who, if, close person to you, you'd be hitting the table saying, no, we're having the very best antibiotics for this condition. So no one wants to be receiving and no one wants to be giving second or third best treatment. So for those of you who Twitter, these next slides have to be out there in social media land to inform patients, to inform health uh, commissioning bodies, to inform other colleagues of the incredible job you can do with your patients with these conditions. So Twitter away. So if we have a look at studies that compare um, subacromial impingement syndrome to exercise. So look at surgery versus exercise for a condition, whatever it means, subacromial impingement at one year, two year, four year, five year follow-ups, there is no difference in outcome in multiple quality studies at any time point and you're providing the care at a fraction of the cost of surgery, saving money for cancer, saving money for other important healthcare interventions. When you look at exercise as a way of reducing surgery. We've got fantastic studies from Sweden that tell us that exercise, if you take people off a surgical list and exercise them, up to 80% of people don't need to go and have surgery. Okay, so that's a huge saving as well. What about people who turn up in your clinic and say, my life's fallen apart, I've got a partial thickness tear of my rotator cuff. The doctor wants to operate, I don't know what I'm doing here, it's gonna get bigger if I don't have an operation. So this study randomizes this group of people to 10 treatments of exercise, or another group, an acromioplasty, remove the acromion in exercise, or the full Monty group, um, repair the cuff, remove the acromion and physio, no difference between the groups, there's no if, extra benefit from surgery for people with partial thickness tears, um, and you're providing care, equal care, not second best care, at a fraction of the cost of surgery. What about people who turn up with full thickness tears that were atraumatic? A different way that this research was done, but what it's telling us, exercising the shoulder, at two years, 75% of people never need to consider surgery. So, all these studies I've just shown you are just exercise-based studies at the shoulder. And I wonder if, and so at the moment, our competition isn't with another profession. It's how can we do what we're doing even better? And so all these studies are just exercise studies at the shoulder. But think about some of the things I was saying. And there's this theory called marginal gains theory. And it was used by Dave um, Brailsford. He was the team manager, the performance director for, Sky, um, for the Sky team. And until he'd come along, no British cyclist had ever won the Tour de France. But as we know, Bradley Wiggins did in 2012. So how did Dave Brailsford get this phenomenal athlete to, to win the Tour de France. And he did something called marginal gains. He looked at every possible option, thing that occurs in the Tour de France. He looked at helmets, clothes, bicycles, seat, everything. And he said, I want to get 1% more improvement from, I know the main thing, so in our case it's exercise, but can we get an extra 1 or 10 or 5% from other interventions as well? So I wonder if we apply, apply marginal gains to our musculoskeletal patients, I wonder if we not only equal surgical outcomes, but we surpass them. So 
I said to you right at the beginning that humans aren't great at swinging from trees, but we're pretty amazing at working under 90 degrees. So maybe we'd get some marginal gains as part of our patient advice by discussing ergonomic factors with our patients. All these things need to be tested in research, but put the pec major in a prime position to work, maybe get the patient standing on a stable platform or wearing the wife's stilettos, maybe that would then provide a more functioning shoulder. Maybe if we don't just concentrate on the shoulder with our exercise program, maybe if we in, try and exercise the whole body, we'll get further improvements in, in our clinical results. Advice is really important. We need to find better ways to provide advice, improve health literacy for patients who don't quite understand what we're on about. Sleep is a profound regenerator of musculoskeletal tissue. How do we spend time discussing sleep with our patients, assessing sleep? that could also potentially reduce free radicals and improve tissue in the shoulder. Talking about inactivity, just general exercise, smoking behaviour, lifestyle issues may give us further marginal gains with our patients. And the last one I want to talk about is nutrition. So this is a study that was just finished by another PhD student, Fiona Sanford. She's a consultant physio um, in London and she looked at the nutrition as part of managing rotator cuff tendinopathy. And she uh, provided, uh, did a study where she did a double uh, blind placebo controlled study, that's pretty unusual in physio to be able to say that, where she took people with rotator cuff tendinopathy and she randomized them to exercise, which we know is good, and um, fish oils in one group and enormous doses of placebos in the second group. So we were looking for marginal gains in this study. Can nutrition make a difference? And what we found using the secondary outcome measure, the SPADI, the Shoulder Pain and Disability Index, at three months we had significant improvement in the group that was taking the fish oils. It wasn't maintained at one year, um, and it wasn't, we didn't find the same thing for our primary outcome measure, but most probably the SPADI is in some ways a more useful outcome measure than, than the Oxford Shoulder Score in this particular study. So there's just one example of experimentation where we may get some improvement in marginal gains. So in, in summary, we can say exercise is effective as surgery for impingement, partial thickness tears, full thickness tears. Structural diagnosis is not possible and there's a really poor correlation between imaging and symptoms. Maybe symptom modification is one way to do our assessment and then we can add rotator cuff exercises, shoulder exercises and body exercises to that. Exercise doesn't have to be, uh, we don't have to think of exercise in terms of structure, in terms of rotator cuff and scapula, they're all the same thing. And maybe marginal gains will give us some additional improvement with our patients. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy, for again enlightening us and I think challenging us again. Um, he will let you know when the study is published you were all part of. Um, our time is up. I'm going to give him the top question that we had today. Jeremy, it says, is, the, is it important which structure causes the pain? Don't we treat more function than structure? So I can't actually hear. It is difficult to hear, yeah. Is it important which structure causes the pain? Don't we treat more function than structure? Yes. Let's see. Best question. And then there's one more question from somebody saying they want to know if you ever don't get a patient better. Yeah. I don't, get, I don't have any different outcomes than anybody in this room. No, I, don't th I think the people who get the people better are the smiling people. We heard from Lisa before. The people who are confident. The people who exude enthusiasm. The people who the patients perceive are are doing, do, working as hard as they can with their patients. And I, I guess some of us really do need to spend some time with psychologists to improve the way that we're managing ourselves, our behaviour with our patients. So I have the same outcomes. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. You can have coffee now again.